My name is Todd Clear. I'm Dean of the School of Criminal Justice. We occupy this building with the law school. Uh, and uh, we are also the home to the Police Institute, which is the main organization responsible for us getting together today. I'm going to introduce the director of the Police Institute in a moment. Um, I'd also like to th thank our uh, other uh, Rutgers co-sponsor, uh, School of Public Affairs and Administration. You'll hear from their dean, uh, um, Mark Holzer, in a minute. Um, I'm particularly delighted to uh, welcome these, this, uh, this esteemed group to, uh, to this conversation about, uh, um, about security and safety in the United States. Um, we here at the School of Criminal Justice are in the business of understanding both academically and practically what it takes to make the world a safer place. We uh, carry out studies, but we also do projects. Or we train students, but we also train professionals. Um, we think of ourselves as a, an asset to the state of New Jersey uh, in its desire to be a safer place for people to live, raise and, uh, live, work, and raise their children. An asset to Rutgers University as a place to uh, do the best kind of scholarship that can take place in criminology. An asset to our fellow citizens who, with whom we share an interest in uh, living a, a, f a free and secure life. Um, a few years ago, uh, when I became dean, uh, the, vacant, the uh, head of the police institute became uh, vacant when, um, when there was a retirement of um, uh, uh, George Kelling. And um, I did a lot of searching around with a lot of people to, to find out what to do about replacing that person. And everybody pointed to the same individual, Tom O'Reilly. Uh, they said, uh, Tom knows New Jersey, Tom knows the federal system, Tom, know, Tom knows the state system, Tom knows law enforcement, and I've since learned that Tom knows everybody. Um, we couldn't get him to come right away. He was busy at that time working in the Justice Department setting up the suspicious activity reporting system. Uh, he had come to the Justice Department after leaving uh, an, um, uh, more than 20 years of service in the Department of Law and Public Safety here in, this, in the state of New Jersey working under several governors and a number of, um, of attorneys general. And um, so we waited for him to come. Uh, some of you who have been following the work of the Police Institute and knew, sort of knew that we went to sleep for a while. We didn't actually go to sleep, we kept doing work, but we didn't do this kind of thing. So Tom hit here with, the, uh, with his, uh, he went, he hit the ground with his feet moving fast, and we have been trying to keep up with him ever since. Um, he is uh, our connection to the world of public safety. Here's the way the School of Criminal Justice hopes to bridge the gap between research about what we know about public safety and action about making public safety happen in the world. So it is my pleasure to introduce the director of the Police Institute, Tom O'Reilly. So that introduction, I had to ask for a raise, I guess. Thank you, Todd. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to do uh, this uh, gathering today. <clears throat> I think it's really uh, interesting in terms of uh, many of you were here a couple months ago when General McCaffrey spoke and we had uh, folks uh, predominantly from New Jersey. Uh, today as we sit here we have people from New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, D.C. Uh, we certainly have uh, people from the federal, state, and local level of government as well as our private sector partners. So I think it's going to be a, a good discussion and I think as any discussion in public safety should be uh, in these days, all these partners being present is uh, an important and, uh, and critical event and I'm sure we'll hear more from our principal speaker in terms of that issue. I also want to uh, acknowledge besides the three schools here at Rutgers, uh, this is being sponsored also by the New Jersey State Chiefs Association. Unfortunately, uh, Chief Ray Haduka from uh, South Brunswick is down with the flu. I don't know, uh, where's Dr. Lacey? We have to have him uh, checked in terms of, there you go. But uh, he wanted to make it, but uh, he, uh, his secretary said that uh, he just couldn't uh, uh, get here today. So, But he's been here in the past, and we look forward to a continuing relationship with the, uh, the Chiefs Association. And finally, uh, several of these events have been uh, sponsored by Mutual Link which is a, a critical partner with many of our public safety agencies here in New Jersey, and it's through their generosity that uh, we're able to put this on today. So, uh, Colin, we're, Colin, I want to uh, extend our thank you to you, Colin, also in terms of that issue. As Todd indicated, the, uh, the Police Institute uh, was first uh, put together by uh, George Kelling of uh, Broken Windows fame, going back to 2001, and in those days it was actually a, a relationship 
between the colonel of the state police, the uh, AG's office, and several other people with George who said we need a place to put together the intersection of research and how that gets applied to the field as well as how best practices get identified, validated, and also applied to the field. In the early stages, we dealt with things like uh, you know, problem solving. We dealt with issues in terms of uh, racially biased policing, some of the violence. <clears throat> the police institute had a role. Many of you may not remember that, but on 9-11, after there was a reaction with the Muslim community, it was the police institute that was the neutral convener with the Muslim community and the law enforcement community, particularly at the state and federal level, because there was a, uh, a degree of mistrust that uh, occurred for those days following the, uh, the attack on the World Trade Center. Today we moved on. We're moving on in terms of research, the application of research, many of the things that uh, Todd talked about. We're looking at a number of collaboration issues with uh, certainly private partnerships, uh, state and local government, uh, working with the, uh, the governor's office and the AG on the issue of violence and taking the lessons learned in terms of the Newark uh, Violence Reduction Initiative which is making some impacts in terms of the violence level in this particular city and possibly moving it on to some of the other major cities uh, around the state. So a lot of interesting things. Uh, we're also working uh, in terms of outside the uh, purely uh, police arena with uh, the Office of Homeland Security and, and Prevention, uh, as well as uh, some of the other uh, state and local agencies to kind of develop out uh, the resources and again, help bring the public safety partners, the law enforcement partners, uh, to the table uh, in a collaborative effort with uh, some of the other folks. So the Distinguished Lecture Series, it's one of our, several of our initiatives. And I guess simply put, our goal on this is threefold. One is to bring thought leaders, like we are privileged today to have with us, and expose those individuals to the leadership of the criminal justice, public safety, public administration, community uh, in New Jersey. Being able to expose them to certain uh, ideas and hopefully be able to take some of those ideas and incorporate it into our day-to-day -day practices as we move forward. Second issue, and it's equally as important, and it's something in terms of being an academic institution, is taking tomorrow's leaders, the students, and some of them are sitting out here in the audience today, and exposing them to you, the leadership today in public safety. That's critical because they need to understand the issues that are, you're facing, the policy implications and other things that are out there. And I think from a learning laboratory perspective, that's a critical uh, issue. And the third, and not in any priority order necessarily, but is the issue of the interaction between the private and public uh, entities that uh, have a mutual responsibility in terms of providing public safety to not only our citizens, but their employees and their customers. So that's an issue we hope to do more of. There are a number of private sector individuals. You'll hear from uh, one in particular on the panel later today. And I think that's something that we hope to uh, cultivate and expand as we uh, move forward. Today, uh, it's a real privilege to have our, uh, our principal speaker join us. He's a man that I, uh, I first knew, and I won't uh, do the introduction uh, in, uh, in terms of that issue because uh, Ed Dixon is going to do that in a minute. But it's a man that I had the, uh, the privilege of personally interacting with in terms of my role in, uh, in New Jersey uh, with uh, the department that he uh, put together. And I was saying to uh, the dean before about, in some ways, this is a, a real laboratory, what he lived through, a laboratory from a public administration perspective, a laboratory certainly from a public safety uh, perspective and a laboratory from a legal perspective. So it's kind of why it's appropriate that our three schools here are hosting him uh, today. But in many ways, uh, I didn't hope to bring back any memories on it. <laughs> but I want to, uh, I also uh, had the privilege of working with an individual who's going to introduce the, uh, the governor. And I first met uh, Ed Dixon actually right after 9-11 when he came in as the assistant special agent in charge for Newark and the uh, whole state of New Jersey. And uh, we interacted with, uh, with Ed a lot in the Attorney General's office. Uh, and then our paths kind of diverged. Uh, actually, we both went to Washington at different times and for different reasons. But as I headed up the uh, nationwide uh, Suspicious Activity Reporting Program, which was a team with uh, DHS, DOJ, 
and Director of National Intelligence Staff, I interacted a lot with the, uh, the uh, National Office of the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and one day I see an email, and lo and behold, it's Ed Dixon. So our past crossed again in terms of our stint in, uh, in Washington. And now Governor Christie has asked him to serve as the Director of the Office of Homeland Security and uh, Preparedness, and it's, uh, it's a privilege to ask Ed to come up to the podium to introduce our uh, principal speaker. Ed? Good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, let me thank uh, Tom and uh, Tom and the uh, Rutgers Police Institute uh, for organizing the Distinguished Lecture Series and for the excellent work that they do in collaborating with the community, with the private sector, and law enforcement to address those criminal justice challenges facing our state and the region. Leaders from government, politics, and the military along with individuals from critical private sector industries have come to Rutgers Newark and have shared their professional experiences and have imparted valuable lessons upon our audience members. Yet today's guest embodies both terms, distinguished and leader, like none other. Throughout his life, Tom Ridge has lived a life of service and has worked diligently to fight for and give back to his country. Tom was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He worked hard to achieve a scholarship to Harvard University, where he graduated with honors in 1967. After his first year of law school at Penn State's Dickinson School of Law, he was drafted by the Army uh, to fight in the Vietnam War. And there as a soldier, he earned the Bronze Star for Valor, the Combat Infantry Badge, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. Following his military service, he returned to Pennsylvania, and in 1972, he completed law school and entered private practice. Ten years later, in 1982, he was elected to represent Pennsylvania in the United States House of Representatives and was one of the first Vietnam veterans elected to Congress. After five terms in Congress, he was twice elected governor of Pennsylvania and led the Commonwealth's expansion of economic development and education reform. In 2001, about halfway through his second term as governor, our nation was attacked. And following those attacks on September 11th, Tom became the first assistant to the president for Homeland, Secur Homeland Security, working closely with then President George W. Bush. In 2003, Tom became the very first secretary of the United States Department of Homeland Security and led the largest reorganization of the federal government since the days of Harry Truman. During his two years at DHS, Secretary Ridge led more than 180,000 employees from more than 20 agencies that was now responsive, responsible for protecting critical infrastructure sites throughout the country, developing a united national response and recovery plan, and ensuring information sharing between and among law enforcement and emergency management agencies at every level of government. It's also worth noting that just a few days ago, on Friday, March 1, 2013, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security celebrated its 10th anniversary. So under Tom Ridge's leadership during his formative years, DHS began its mission to lead our nation's homeland security efforts. And because of his early vision and because of his early leadership, our nation's homeland security uh, uh, evolved into an agency facing new challenges presented by an ever-changing threat environment. Currently, Tom is president and CEO of Ridge Global, a leading team of international experts assisting businesses and governments in the areas of emergency preparedness, risk and, and crisis management, infrastructure protection, and strategic growth. Recently, he was called on Congress to enact cybersecurity legislation to bolster the security of our public and private cyber networks and our cyber infrastructure. So as Director of the State of New Jersey's Office of Homeland Security, I am grateful for the work Secretary Rich has done over the years to help our nation become better prepared to, to protect against and to recover from a, a variety of hazards and threats. And I believe as Americans, we all have a tremendous amount of respect and admiration 
for its commitment to serving our great country. We are incredibly fortunate to have an American hero. I'm sorry. We are incredibly fortunate to have an American hero. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we are incredibly fortunate to have an American hero with us today. In light of his prior experience and continuing service, I am especially looking forward to his remarks this afternoon. Therefore, it is my honor to introduce today's guest speaker, Tom Ridge. Mr. Secretary, welcome to New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was a lovely introduction. I thank you very much, Ed. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the warm reception. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of your lecture series. Uh, Todd, it was a great pleasure to have the opportunity to spend some time with you. And when you introduced uh, Tom, I thought you should have been the first Secretary of Homeland Security with that background. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've heard you referred to as the first uh, Homeland Security Director. You just have 180,000 people, but you certainly had the portfolio. And Ed, thank you very much for your, uh, for your kind remarks as well. Um, I couldn't help but think here, since this is the School of Criminal Justice and connected with the law school and you've talked about those connections, uh, you know, if you heard my resume, you know that I spent most of my life in public service. And uh, a lot of people said they had a lot of jobs, you couldn't keep one, but I really felt strongly about public service and I still do. But I remember I had 10 years of practicing law before I ran for Congress. And uh, I say this because I met a couple of law students, I think there are a couple of law students here. and. When I ran, there were a couple very important things on my resume. They didn't care where I went to college, and they really didn't care that I practiced law, but I had been both a prosecutor and a defense attorney. When we're running for office, if those of you in law school that decide to run for office, if you're a defense attorney, that's fine, but there's not a warm, fuzzy feeling for defense attorneys in the body politic. So I emphasize the fact that I've been a prosecutor, and that, that seemed to go over very well. And obviously, being an Army veteran, uh, certainly helped. And as I was walking in, talking to some folks, we were talking about the adjustments from the public sector, where I spent most of my life, to the private sector today. And ironically, in exchanging notes with uh, some of your colleagues, my greatest adjustment was simply transportation. I like walking through front doors. I like parking my own car. But when I was governor, the state police provided my drive drivers for my family and me. When I was in the White House and as Secretary of Homeland Security, Secret Service provided uh, transportation. And my last night on the job, the head of the Secret Service detail shook my hand and he said, good night and good luck. And I kind of figured out, what's he talking about, the good luck? I understood the good night piece. And I got up the next morning and my routine for almost three and a half years was up very early down the steps into the car. I get a briefing on the way into the White House, down to the Situation Room, get a briefing from the CIA, the Homeland Security, go upside the Oval Office, wait outside for the Andy Card or somebody to wave us in, have the meeting with President Bush and Vice President Cheney, maybe National Security Advisor George Tenet, FBI, Justice and Ashcroft and everything. But I had a car. All the time. Now, by the way, I got to tell you, sometimes I take the security, I, I, I think you should be unobtrusive. But when you got a big black car and then you got a sedan in the front and the back, it kind of sends a signal to everybody else. So anyhow, that's another story. <laughs> so I'm, my first day there, I have no car. I get up, I want to go somewhere. I'm now a back in the private citizen. I'm going to go somewhere. My kids have the school, one car to school. My wife has a car someplace else. So that night I wanted to go to the mall. So I said to my son, can dad borrow the car? <laughs> How many of you ever borrowed a car from your son or daughter? So I got the look. And my son's a very respectful boy. I said, son, give me the keys. I'm leasing the bloody car. And he, he looked a really mischievous look on his face. And he flipped me the keys. And he said, two things, Pop. I said, be respectful to your dad. He said, watch where you park it. And don't forget to fill it up with gas before you bring it home. <laughs> so we made the adjustment. And now I get an opportunity to talk. Uh, the other nice thing about being a private citizen is I can, uh, when you're governor, you want to make news because you're the bully pulpit yours, the fulcrum reserves. But when you're the, listen, when you're in a cabinet, you're working for the president, it's really not your position 
or your prerogative to make a lot of news. Uh, I remember leaving a press conference, I spoke and then the media, we were in Southern California at the time and they asked me about immigration. Now I think that's a big issue. I hope both parties get off their backsides and time to resolve it. We need an immigration policy. But this is like 10 years ago, it's 2003, I'm in Southern California and they said, well, Mr. Secretary, what do you think ought to be done? Well, I had a ridge plan. I thought all about immigration reform. And so I just laid out the ridge plan. My press secretary says to me as I'm walking to the car, you did it now. I said, what'd I do? You made news. I said, how'd I make news? You laid out a pretty complete plan to deal with immigration reform. I said, well, they asked me a question. I gave them an answer. I've been thinking about this issue for a long time. Two hours later, we get a call from the White House. What are you doing laying out an immigration plan when the president hasn't laid his out yet? I'm a private citizen, I can lay out any plan I want. <laughs> That's the deal. And so I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to spend a little time with you this afternoon as the warm-up act to a very, very distinguished panel. And I think the purpose of the lecture series, I think, uh, Tom, is really to get you engaged with this uh, distinguished group of uh, individuals who are uh, very much operational in that space of hometown and homeland security. And I do have a couple of thoughts that I hope we will pave, pave the way for a, a good and provocative and hopefully uh, um, educational exchange between the audience and the panelists. My experience in dealing with emergency preparedness and response and the need to pull together both public and private sector assets goes back to 1985 when I'm a second term congressman, three tornadoes bounced around three of the four counties, three, my three counties, and wiped out Albion, Atlantic, and Wheatland, Pennsylvania. It was a beautiful end of May day, uh, but the destruction was rather remarkable. And anybody that's been at a site after a weather event of that magnitude, and I'm speaking about people who responded to Irene and Sandy, but you know what I'm coming from. And it was at that time, my first introduction was to FEMA. And frankly, and I say this with great respect because I'm a strong advocate of FEMA, the men and women, the professionals there do a great job. But back then it had a civil defense mindset. And there were not necessarily emergency managed professionals dominating the infrastructure. They didn't have the volunteer system. It was just a different structure and frankly, the second disaster, and we polled everybody afterwards about the Red Cross and all the public and private sector efforts to support the communities, the families, the businesses, and FEMA was the second disaster that showed up. And so I spent a couple of years as a young congressman writing the Stafford Act, and many of you are probably familiar with that. So I must tell you that I'm a strong proponent of FEMA. One of the biggest debates we had in the course of building the Department of Homeland Security was whether or not FEMA should be in the department. And I said if FEMA wasn't in it, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. If you didn't have FEMA inside the department, you'd have to have a FEMA inside the department, and you didn't need to, because it really is an all-hazards agency. And so we've got it in. That was the first exposure. And then, of course, as governor, I have to make requests to the White House from time to time in terms of disaster relief, as your governors have had to do on a couple of occasions. Tough decision, because there are thresholds. And sometimes the toughest decision for a governor is whether or not you ask for the declaration. Because there are certain minimal standards. And the biggest pushback on areas that we received when I was governor a couple of times when there was a significant disaster, but it didn't meet the threshold for a national disaster, I didn't bother requesting federal assistance. So be it. And then, of course, DHS. And one of the challenges around DHS and one of the principles, and this is where it probably gets us to our basic discussion today, is unity of effort around a public strategy. Homeland Security is about a unity of effort. Hopefully, conceptually, and it's better today than it's been before, but there's still work to do, unity of effort horizontally across federal departments, but unity of effort vertically with the states and the locals Nonprofits and academic institutions. And remember, there was no architecture 
I can remember President Bush calling me and ask if I could visit, I'd go down to the White House the next day to talk to him about accepting the position. There was no architecture. There was no plan. There have been a lot of discussions and a lot of white papers written about creating a border-centric agency. But frankly, truth be known, I accepted the job and then we wrote the job description. And initially into the work that the White House did in response to 9-11, there was no consideration of a department. It had been talked about, but the reports were sitting on the shelves. So finally, for a multitude of reasons, which is not important to this conversation, the president decided to promote the department. And after considerable challenges, political and otherwise, we built we began the process, we didn't build it, began the process of integrating 20 plus units of government, five or six were really the muscular agencies, Secret Service, Coast Guard, TSA, former immigration, Customs and Border Protection, a couple of others, and then we've got little units of government from every place else. And so while you're trying to integrate the business side of this, that's the IT, it's procurement, it's budget, it's fiscal issues, on the other side you're trying to develop a policy to make the country safer and more secure. This piece is still going on, as it should be. And you mentioned the first anniversary. I got sworn in on January, the end of January. Within five weeks, the department doors were open. Oh, by the way, the National Security Council showed up about a week before the door opened and said, hush, hush, hush. we think we're going to Iraq. You might want to button up America and try to build relationships with the state and locals before we go in because there may be blowback once we go in. Not too many people know it, but we called it Liberty Shield. So we actually began to try to operate and build a unity of effort horizontally and vertically even before we opened the doors. And thanks to Colonel Bill Parrish and a good group of people we pulled together, we were able actually to, to build a, a modest infrastructure just in case something happened after we went into Iraq. But that unity of effort concept is very, very important. Because at the end of the day, organizations, public or private, Profit non, you, Homeland Security is about risk management. You can never eliminate the risk of a terrorist attack. You can never uh, uh, eliminate the risk associated with that black swan event, whatever it might be, the natural weather event. You know it's going to happen. So how are you prepared, whether it's a terrorist attack, a hurricane, whatever it is, how well are you prepared to identify, detect, deter, prevent, respond, and recover? Different dimensions and all that, but at the heart of all of that is a unity of effort. I can argue, and I think straight face, not argue, but suggest to you that when you assess your vulnerability to a terrorist attack or a weather event or anything in between, it's not just the event you should be worried about, it's a system you have in place to deal with the event. Because if the system you have in place to deal with the event by design is prepared to respond, recover, remediate and recover, the risk of loss has been mitigated. Certainly there's going to be loss. So it's not just an assessment of vulnerability based on, oh, it might be a hurricane, it may be an earthquake, it may be a terrorist event, but how is that community, how is that company, how is that region prepared in advance to deal with that event? That's a unity of effort. Now that unity of effort requires both the federal government and everybody else vertically being on the same page. And at the epicenter of all that, in my judgment, is information. And how do you connect, how do you connect people, organizations, communities, businesses, so that before, during, and after event, the decision makers have timely information. In this instance, because of Irene and Sandy and the fortune of the snowstorm, it's to respond, remediate, respond as quick as you can, and recover. Now, I think, frankly, the lessons learned between Katrina and Sandy are meaningful, and I'm preaching to the choir. I was not involved in either one, but as a citizen, as an observer, but someone that pays attention to those things going back to 1985, 
when a natural weather event wiped out three little communities in my congressional district, I pay attention to how people respond and recover. And frankly, the response that your governor and, 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 and Governor Cuomo, but I'm talking right now, right now, but I'm in New Jersey, I want to talk about Governor Cuomo in New York, Governor Christie here in New Jersey, the response here seemed to be entirely different than it was in Katrina. What was the difference? It just seemed to me, I may be wrong, and maybe we have this to scan, the unity of effort from the federal government down vertically to the state and locals and into the private sector, there were much greater and better connection both before, during, and after. Both communities saw the potential of a major weather event coming before them. One group of communities seemed to be preparing for it days in advance and the others did not. And when the disaster struck, one community seemed to, one, one area in this country seemed to have the federal leadership, political leadership, and the state leadership, and the local leadership in sync along with the private sector and everybody else. Another region of the country did not. That's what I'm talking about in terms of unity of effort. And at the heart of all that, in my judgment, is information sharing. You know, I, I did spend some time in the military as an infantry sergeant. I wasn't a pathfinder. Pathfinders are a certain unit in the military, and they kind of drop you in sometimes, clear out the landing zone. There may be special operation you're doing, and they're, 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 their motto is first in, last out. Well, you know what the unity of effort, when it comes down to local communities, you're the first in, but you're never out. It's your town, it's your businesses, it's your schools, it's your families, it's your employees. So the unity of effort can only be, it can only maximize its effectiveness if the folks at the local level, this is a series, the hometown is linked up. And my sense is in response to Sandy, and I've talked to some of you here, but you know, you had, uh, again, you got the policy. What's the policy? We want people connected. We want interoperability. We want people to understand uh, the decision makers to get as much information as they can to make those decisions. We want it to be accurate. We want it to be timely so people can take the policy we pull together and we want to make sure that these things happen. So here I think you've done a pretty good job of uniting policy and technology. I think you've done that with MutualLink. And based on those connections, based on that information sharing, I think your response was substantially, appreciably, by any magnitude, far, far better than in Katrina. It's to be, you're to be commended for that. One of the challenges I have, I think nationally, however, if you believe as I do in the importance of this concept of unity of effort and information sharing, is that building a trusting relationship between the public sector and the private sector. You know, I, I, and you know it, 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 at the heart of the work that you did, information sharing at the right time and the right information is probably the most important thing you can do in any situation. I don't care whether you're combating terrorism, responding to an event, any other kind of event. And there still is, and I'm going to say this because I don't have to answer to anybody, I don't think there's enough trust between the public sector and the pop private sector and the private sector and the public sector. And you know what my mantra is? If we can't trust one another to share information, then who the hell are we going to trust? I'll give you a good example, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but you know, there was just an executive order around cybersecurity the other day from the president. And people have no idea, the, the, the digital world is, a, the ubiquity of the digital world is the greatest strength, it's also the world's greatest weakness. Because you have points of access around the globe. And the president's executive order, and I give the president credit for raising the executive order, for signing it, because any time the president of the United States can say to this country, by the way, we're all digitally connected. The government relies on it. Private sector relies on it. You rely on it. But it's insecure. And we need to do a better job of securing the digital space. And one of the first provisions in this executive order, the president directs the federal government, that horizontal unity of effort, to share unclassified information. 
to share unclassified information, which it seems rather remarkable to me that we need the President of the United States telling agencies of government it's okay to do that. Well, frankly, what happens at, their, at, the, at that level across the federal government isn't necessarily what's happening down here, now that you're linked up. Because you figured out a long time ago how important it is to be connected and to be able to share. You've also figured out how important it is to include the private sector. I saw how important it was as the private sector responded to those tornadoes. I saw it occasionally as governor, but I got another great glimpse of how the private sector, if invited and given a role, is open and willing to become part of the process. You got to pull them in, in a meaningful way. But in 2004, there were two conventions, one in, in Boston, one in New York City. Obviously, you take these national conventions at that time, uh, we considered them to be national special security events, NSSEs, they've changed the name now, a lot of security going in. But we identified multiple dozens of private sector companies prior to the conventions and said, under certain sets of circumstances, we may need your capabilities or your capabilities or your capabilities. They were delighted to do it. Now, as I look back, I'm not ha sure how effective our communication to all those groups would have been almost 10 years ago. They were players. They were willing to participate. But frankly, they weren't as well connected as I think you are today. So when I'm saying this whole notion of unity of effort, there's a, a maturity, there's an evolution. And I frankly think New Jersey's done a pretty good job of it over the past couple of, uh, couple of years. There's a, uh, there's a great, interesting book that I might recommend to you by the name, a fellow by the name of John Morton. It's called uh, Next Generation Homeland Security. And he really talks about network federalism. That's one of the challenges we have in the country. We're a federal system. And therefore, you have many political subdivisions. And so as you're trying to get them to collaborate and work together, and you have all these incredible assets out there in the private sector, and one other reason that you need to trust the government should be trusting the private sector and the private sector should be trusting government is that it is that privately owned infrastructure that basically runs government, upon which government relies. Of course, the private sector relies the government on doing their thing. So that whole notion of trust is uh, not necessarily impediment, but there are some reservations and some doubts that I think have to be overcome to build the kind of a network. And again, I was talking to some of your folks, and you had utility companies here connected, and you had the hospitals connected, and you had the state and the locals connected, the first responders connected, the police, the sheriffs, everybody. That's exactly what I thought way back when, in 2001 and then 2003, when we built up the Department of Homeland Security, that's precisely what I thought unity of effort was all about. I think you're practicing it well. I'm sure you're going to continue to uh, move down that path and continue to make improvements. I think uh, Craig Fugate, FEMA director now, has a term to, he talks about communities of resiliency. And I think you are one because you are interconnected. You manage to match policy with technology and pull it together with a public and private partnership in mind. So I want to commend you for that and thank you for giving you the opportunity to share these initial thoughts with you and uh, hopefully led the way to uh, what hopefully will be a, a good uh, provocative discussion with a lot of input from uh, the audience. Thank you very much.